Satan is the conversation today. We're going to be talking about Satan. If you would open your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Um, Last week, I said we're going to talk about spiritual warfare. As I was continuing to study and prepare and look at this passage, the theme isn't spiritual warfare in general. It's it's specifically Satan. And I thought, you know what? I think we should talk about this. Because did you know that Satanology is an actual branch of theology? Like there's soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation. There's theology, doctrines of God. That's just like an overall branching thing. But there's pneumatology, that's the doctrines about the Holy Spirit, pneuma, spirit. Then you have Satanology, no joke, which is a branch within angelology. It's kind of its own branch in theology. Now, that being said, you don't need to remember any of those words. But what we do need to remember is that the Bible has specific things it teaches about Satan. And it's helpful for us to be equipped because people, I think, make one of two mistakes often when it comes to the issue of Satan. One mistake is... They blame everything on Satan. Everything is Satan. Satan woke me up last night and wouldn't let me sleep. I was like, no, that was your cat. (laughs) That was my cat, actually, (laughs) whose name I'm thinking of changing, so I can make that claim later. But um, this actually can be a problem. If I blame everything on Satan, it can lead lead me to a very fearful place, and especially children. I think the children who hear parents do this, they become very scared and very fearful. You know, it's like, oh, oh, is that Satan? That's Satan. That's Satan. I mean, you know, that's the devil kind of thing going on. So, but there's another problem with this. Um, It leads to a lack of personal responsibility. If I blame everything on Satan, nothing's my fault. When I, when I, you know, stayed up too late, woke up late, got to work late, did it again, did it again, got fired, Satan. You know, the enemy persecuting and attacking me. And it's like, no, you were, you were irresponsible. That's you. And so we want to take personal responsibility, not to mention that when you blame everything on the devil, you look crazy. And God doesn't want us to look crazy. Not, um, you know, unless it's for the sake of the gospel, not for the sake of us being weird. Um, another problem we have, so blaming everything on Satan is one thing. Another issue is dismissing Satan entirely. And that is probably the more common one. That's more common. This, I think, leads us to walking through a minefield as if we were prancing through, prancing through a, pr- a playground. We try saying that three times fast, <laughs> prancing through a playground. It can be dangerous to ignore the fact that, as it says in verse 8 in 1 Peter 5, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about, uh, around, about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So, I don't want to completely dismiss it and act like this is not a reality that we live in where we have an adversary who is the devil who's going around trying to bring destruction into people's lives. I should be sober. I should be vigilant. So why should I study Satan? I think my, my quickest, easiest answer for this, for those who would be like, please don't talk about that. I'd say, well, God talks about Satan in the Bible. And I think that if God didn't want us to study it, he wouldn't have written about it in his book. <laughs> he just would have left the topic out. There's lots of topics he left out he didn't bother to discuss because it's not meant to be for Christian doctrine. But I think it's enough of a reason that Satan's in the scriptures, detailed descriptions and warnings, that we should go ahead and dig in. We should go ahead and dig in. So we don't want to have an obsession with Satan. That's a bad thing. To be, some people are obsessed with angels. I feel like this somehow helps them with the distance they have between them and God. So they talk about angels, 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 but there isn't actually a connection with God personally. And that can actually be a negative thing. So I don't want to obsess, but accurate knowledge about Satan and about demons and things like this, it should only lead to empowerment, not fear. It should help me in my life. I should be sober. I should be vigilant. I should not walk away with fear. I should not walk away with with fright, but I should walk away with empowerment, I think. The early church actually knew about Satan and knew about the way Satan worked, which is why it was, it was written to them that we are not ignorant of Satan's devices in 2 Corinthians. He actually says to them, 2 Corinthians 2.11, we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. Meaning they were not ignorant of Satan's devices. Like they were actually aware of the things that Satan would use to mess them up. And so they were taking actions based on that awareness. So it was empowering. It was protecting them. Unfortunately, nowadays, sometimes we're ignorant. Because a lot of the preachers... I think they feel like they'll, be look, they'll look crazy if they teach on this topic. And they don't want to turn people off. And I'm like, man, 
turn people off. Like, let's just, let's just be Christians. Let's just be Bible believers who hold fast to the word of God. And if people don't like it, they're not going to like it no matter how much you water it down. And let's, let's just be, let's just be, let's be us following Jesus and holding fast to God's word. So here we are, 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is called your adversary. He's in an adversarial position towards you, towards me, coming after us adversarially. I've used it in every possible <laughs> sense there. So that is Satan's thing. That's what he does. He comes after us. Let me read to you in Ephesians 6. It says this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And this complete, uh, there's like a unity in the way the scripture talks about our, our spiritual battle against the enemy. We are just to stand. I just remain. I hold strong. I don't actually have to defeat the enemy. I just stand. I hold my ground. That's actually how we fight that spiritual battle. So it's not flesh and blood. I'm not going against other humans. But it, there is a battle against the reality, which is Satan, his empire, and how he attacks us. Ultimately, those principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this age are controlled by Satan. And we'll get into that as well in a second here. I think the, the old phrase, it takes two to tango, that's true. It takes two to tango. Tango is some sort of dance that I don't know how to do. But it takes two people to do that, but it only takes one person to fight. It really doesn't take two. I remember being in school and two people would get in a fight and a teacher might come up and say, hey, and you'd be like, teacher, they started it. And the teacher turned and said, it doesn't matter who started it. And I think this is one of the most foolish things a teacher could say, setting a very horrible standard for kids. Yes, it matters. World War II, it matters who starts it. We're not just invading, you know, for no reason in some other country. It matters who starts it. But if one person wants to fight you and they're committed to this cause, it's going to happen and you're not going to be able to stop it. The only question is how will you deal with the scenario? Well, Satan's your adversary. And he's going to fight you. He's coming after you. He's coming after me. He has an onslaught and an attack that is constantly coming our way, whether you like it or not. No matter how nice we are, no matter how cute or good looking, no matter how funny we are or how much we get along with worldly people, it's like, it's like Satan is out to destroy us. That's what the scripture seems to declare very clearly. So let's talk about this jerk a little bit, Satan. Um, who is he really? <laughs> who is he? Well, he's more than an idea. There are some who, um, in the liberal theologies that came up in the last, well, since about the 1700s, I think, they started really pushing these liberal theologies. Um, they said that Satan was basically just an idea that represents evil in general, but not an actual person. That is a theology that's driven by unbelief, ultimately. They would water down, anybody who's, who's, who waters down one area of scripture usually waters down a whole lot of scripture, too. It's, we're sort of consistent in our treatment of the Bible most of the time. But Satan is a person. He's an individual. He's not a human. He was an angel. Um, let's read a couple passages. There's two passages in the Bible that deal with Satan specifically, and I'm going to teach you how to remember them forever. Are you ready? It's Isaiah 14, and it's Ezekiel 28. And the way you can remember this, this is my method of remembering it, is Isaiah 14 times 2 Ezekiel's 28. <laughs> Isaiah 14 times 2 Ezekiel's, which is not a word, 28. Um, why? Um, I learned in school to use memory aids. As ridiculous as they might be, they're effective. <laughs> so, so whatever it takes. Um, Ezekiel 28, verse 11. Let's start there. It says, Oh, excuse me, and it's referring to Satan here as the power behind the king of Tyre or the city of Tyre, T-Y-R-E, the power behind that city. That's how he's referred to in Isaiah as well as the power behind the throne. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. That would be Satan here and it'll become clear 
in the, in the following verses and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. I, I know who was in Eden other than Adam and Eve. Right? We had one other being there other than God. That would be the serpent. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. Um, that may refer to simply him being multicolored because they use stones to represent the various colors. Um, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Some people say that um, they think Satan had uh, musical instruments built into his body. That's actually not clearly what it's saying. But there seems that there were musical instruments that he was going to, to use. The workmanship of the timbrel, they were created when he was created. So it was made for him to use. And then, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. It's clear this is not about a human born in sin. This is about a, a being that was created and perfect until it chose to sin. But the, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God and I destroyed you, O covering cherub from the midst of the fiery stone. Seems to be like the altar or the throne of God. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. So it was a self-focus and self-worship and self-aggrandizement. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. The trading again comes up. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You've become a horror and shall be no more forever. I think this, this passage capsulates the beginning of Satan till the, till the end of Satan. So it's actually even speaking to the future. So you were in Eden and then now you fall in and then there's a time coming where they will, you will be this horror and you'll be no more forever. You're going to be cast into the lake of fire. He was called the anointed cherub that covers. That word cherub actually has a, a connotation of covering. The word itself means like covering. There's two words used for angels in the Old Testament, uh, cherub and then seraph or cherubim and seraphim. Those are just plurals. The I am just makes it plural. So cherubs, cherubim, same thing. Um, the anointed cherub that covers. It seems that, that he was in the presence of God. You think of the, the in the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, they had... You remember Indiana Jones? And then they had the, these angels that had their wings spread out and they're touching and they're covering the presence of God. So in other words, they're right there with the presence of God. So you were anointed cherub that covers. Seems that he was in this type of role. He was full of wisdom. He was perfect until he sinned. That's in verse 15. And then this, here's just my thought on the idea of this trading. He's accused of trading. You're trading, you're trading, you're trading. Trading is deal making. I think that the way that Satan may have gotten the, the, the third of the angels to fall with him is by deal making. Hey, follow me and you will have this. I will give you this position in my cabinet if you endorse me. <laughs> right? This sort of thinking. That's kind of what I see happening. Um, trading. Perhaps that's how he drew away those other angels. Um, another passage is in Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. So let's look there. Remember Isaiah 14 times 2. He is seen here as, again, the power behind the nations. And it says in verse 12, I'll give you just a moment to get there. I don't want to cause any paper cuts. Verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Lucifer, which seems to mean light bearer. That was the name he had. It seems pre-fall. That's like a pre-fall name. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Above the stars of God seems to refer to the angels. He's, he's like, I'm going to be above all the other angels. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be better than the most high. No, he says, I'll be like the most high. He seemed to want a position of equality with God. Interestingly, he wanted to be like, I'm just with God. I'm not better than God, but I'm with God. Interesting. Um, that actually fits Mormon theology quite well. 
Verse 15, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the grave, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you, future tense here, will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners? They'll be shocked at how pathetic he is. Satan will not be the king in hell. He will be a sight to behold. How utterly pathetic. This is the one that ruined the world. This is the one that messed with the whole, all the nations. And you get the, the image clearly in these passages that, that he not only pulled down the third, which we get from Revelation as well, but he also shook the earth and he messed with the nations and he just brought desolation onto the earth. He caused a lot of trouble. We also get from Isaiah 14 that pride ultimately is what caused his fall. He was perfect, he was sinless, and it was arrogance and pride that brought his fall. It was for the sake of his own splendor, it said in um, Ezekiel 28 verse 17. He wanted his own splendor, and for that he was corrupted. His wisdom became distorted because he was focused on pride. You can't have pride and have it, and, and have it not distort your wisdom. Your wisdom, though it might have been really great, will get distorted and twisted with pride. It's inevitable. Um, which is why I have a hard time with um, arrogant leaders because arrogant leaders will inevitably make some poor decisions because of their pride. Um, we can even look at Josiah, who was a great king in Israel, but because of his arrogance, he ends up getting himself killed because he just thought he knew better. You know. He has other names in the scripture as well. So he's called Lucifer in Isaiah 14. He's never called this again. This seems to have been his pre-fall name. You know, Saul went from Saul to Paul, right? And he got, he's given a new name. Satan, it seems, went from Lucifer, this wonderful name, this light bearer, and then he got a host of other names that are not good. He's never called Lucifer again. He's never called that again. Instead, he's called other things like Satan, which means adversary, devil, he's called the deceiver, he's called the destroyer, he's called Beelzebub and Belial. These names, Beelzebub means Lord of Dung. The Lord of Dung. This is not a compliment. Belial means worthless. Worthless. He's called liar as a title, accuser, evil one, tempter, murderer, and enemy. These are the names he's given. These are the names he's given. So it's, it's certainly not good. In the passages we read, Satan is equated with like the leaders of Tyre and the leaders of Babylon. And I think the point here is because Satan is behind those guys controlling those nations. He is, in a sense, the puppet master of the unsaved. Unsaved people and nations even are being guided by the invisible strings of the enemy. This is what the scripture clearly teaches. It says that Satan in the New Testament, we're told he's the ruler of the darkness of this age. We're told he's the God of this age, and we're told that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So the world is under his sway. He's just going, go this way, go that way. We'll get more into that in just a moment. Um, but first, I want to cover something I think can be a fairly common. Uh, those who I think are biblically based, this wouldn't throw you for a second, but perhaps, you know, you're not as familiar with the Bible. And so you unintentionally import like Bugs Bunny cartoons into your theology, you know? And so you think perhaps Satan is red with a pitchfork and a tail that has like a, 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 like a, like a fish hook on the end of it or something like that. Um, but this is certainly not the case. It's certainly not the case. Satan would never appear like that for a few reasons. One is, he didn't originally look like that. It seems he was beautiful, full of beauty. But two, Satan's goal is not to try to be unlike God, but to try to be like God. There was an old movie I saw when I was a kid. It was called, oh, I think it was called, Oh God, You Devil. And it had George Burns in it. George Burns, wasn't that his name? The cigar smoking, right? And he, and he played the part of God and he played the part of the devil. <laughs> so, and, and now I don't actually, I'm mean, honest, I don't really remember much of the movie. I was pretty young at the time, but I just remember being shocked that when, when whichever one showed up second, God or the devil, it was the same actor for both. And I was like, oh, that's weird. 
And the point was that the enemy, Satan, just wanted to look like God. It was probably the only biblical moment in the movie, I imagine. <laughs> but yet, I think it was an interesting illustration. Satan wants to look beautiful. Satan wants to look attractive. Satan's, you know, not going to show up uh, in that fashion as the, uh, as the classic Bugs Bunny type Satan. So what does he look like? Well, there is one time he came as a serpent in Genesis. He showed up as a serpent, and that doesn't seem to be his original form. So either he is taking the bot, taking control, possessing the body of this animal and using it, or he's manifesting a body somehow. Um, those seem to be the only two options. 2 Corinthians 11.14 says that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. So he comes and appears like an angel of light, and he says, Hi, I am Moroni, perhaps. And he shows up as an angel of light. This is a deception. It's a disguise. It's easy to do. It's easy to do. We get this, again, during our election cycle when someone shows up and says, I am a conservative. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Satan is one of many fallen angels. There's actually quite a few. And, but he's not just one among the crowd. He's their leader, the scripture declares. Let me read to you. Matthew 25, 41. Check out what is said. Then he also will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So they're under his authority. They're under his leadership, maybe because of the deal that they made at the time. And then his rebellion didn't work. And so they remain sort of in his domain. Revelation 12, verses 7, and then again in verse 9, it says that the dragon and his angels, the devil and his angels, were cast out. So again, we get the dragon is obviously the devil here, and his angels, he has his own angels. This leads to an interesting question. Is when did they fall? Like, at what point did this fall happen? Because I don't have a pinpoint moment in the scriptures when I can say that's when the heaven like battle or whatever took place and the fell the fall happened. Um, it really isn't clear. It really isn't clear. What we do know is it seems like it must have happened before Genesis chapter 3 when Satan comes and he's tempting Eve. It's possible that that moment of Satan coming and tempting Eve is the fall. It's possible that this is part of the fall. That there's a curse that falls on him at that same time. That this may be related to the fall. Now, there might be more dynamics to it. Maybe there's a heavenly side to it as well and stuff. But, but that's where we see Satan show up and he's doing a, an original wrong. And he lies. Jesus calls him the father of lies. So it seems to tie it into this very moment here. So it's possible that Genesis 3 records that. Um, I don't know why more theologians don't consider Genesis 3 as a possibility for that's the fall. Some think that when Satan fell, it would have it destroyed the earth or something like this, but I, I don't think so. Um, in fact, he's fallen, but he has not been cast down just yet. That's in Revelation chapter 14. You read about this, the destruction, uh, the battle in heaven where Michael finally gets to fight Satan, takes him, kicks him out of heaven, and then he comes to the earth to persecute the Christians and persecute the Jews. So we'll come back to that in just a moment. So there's a lot here, but I want to give us a good survey of, of, of an idea of who he is and, and, and what Satan can do and what Satan cannot do. Satan's organization, and I, I think it's fair to call it that, is, is um, it's intelligent and it's organized and it is a planned out thing. It's not just a reckless group of little motley demons going around just trying to like poke people in the, in, you know, waking you up, shaking your bed and waking you up and then running away laughing. They're not toddlers, <laughs> they're, they're demons, and they're very organized, and check this out, Ephesians 6, 12, it says about them, right, I read this earlier, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, and these seems like categories and ranks and things like that are going on here. 1 John five nineteen says that we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of of the wicked one. So Satan has sort of two factions in his organ in his organization of evil. He has the demons, the fallen angels, and he has the world of the unsaved that are under his control. And that's important for us to realize. 
Satan is behind the evil in this world. Satan's behind the evil that is going on spiritually as well as humanly. But after saying all this, I don't want us to get the wrong idea. Satan is not the yang to God's yen. Right? The idea of yin yang, from my understanding of it, is that you've got a balance of good and evil. There is no such thing as a balance between good and evil. There's no appropriate amount of evil <laughs> that we should have to balance out good. Oh, you're just too good. You should be a little more evil sometimes to balance out. That is a totally twisted worldview. We believe that God created everything good, and in the end it's going to be perfectly wonderfully good again. Evil is a temporary thing being allowed for the glory of God for a season, and God's redeeming things out of that. So he is not the, the yin to God's yang. He's not evil incarnate. For instance, if Satan was suddenly disappeared from the universe, didn't exist, evil would still exist. People would still be doing bad things. It wouldn't be as bad, I'm sure, but bad things would still be happening. Satan is not the bad God and God's the good God. Satan's not a God. You cannot compare Satan to God. That's what he wants you to do, <laughs> but, it's, but it's simply not true. Satan is a created being. Like all of the angels, they're all created beings. Satan, it seems, while he has fallen and he's, in, and he's sinned, but he has not been barred from heaven. As you read Job, we actually read about how Satan goes up to heaven and there he is going and conversing with God about people on earth. So now he's fallen. His fall from his state of perfection into his state of depravity, that's happened. But he still has access into heaven. That access doesn't get cut off until Revelation later on. And he's cast down in that mid-tribulation time in the middle of the seven years when Satan comes to the earth with great wrath because he knows his time is short. And he tries to persecute and attack and he just wants to blow everything up, basically. Like Iran. Um, <laughs> so, so that's pretty much how he is. <laughs> or North Korea. One or the other, I don't know. Maybe it's like a perfect mixture of Iran and North Korea. That's, there's Satan right there. Um, Satan, the good news is, he's limited. He's limited. So he's not the embodiment of all evil, although he's very wicked, that's for sure. But he's also very limited. Satan is more powerful than me and you, clearly. But he is not comparable to God. For instance, he's not omnipresent. Satan can't hear what I'm saying over here and hear what, you know, the Pope is whispering over there and then hear whatever's going on in some bathroom in Taiwan at the same time. Like this is not, he's not capable of this sort of thing, which is why he has to have an organized structure around him. He is, however, given credit for what he does. So this is why he could be like, hey, Satan's going around to see who he can devour. And hey, watch out for Satan's attack on your life. Does that mean that Paul's saying Satan himself is coming after you? No, it's more like the way we do it even in our own country. We go, Obama did this. Bush did this. But it's not as though like, like I could say Bush looked for weapons of mass destruction. Well, no, I mean, he didn't go over there with like a magnifying glass and comb the desert. He sent people to do his bidding. They did it and reported back to him. So anything that the demons do or that the world does under the influence of Satan, he is given credit for. So I'm not to look for Satan everywhere, everywhere, but rather to see the influence that he has in the world and in the lives around me and perhaps in my own life. So he's given credit for what's done under his influence. And that's a normal way the scripture is communicated. Satan is um, doomed. This is good news. He's utterly doomed. He's going to fail. In fact, let me read to you actually this passage where Michael fights Satan. It's actually Revelation 12. And he loses. Revelation 12 verses 7 through 9. Some of us would actually really like to just be a fly on the wall to see this happen. Because it just seems really intense and very interesting. I'll admit, I'd like to watch it from a distance. Revelation 12, verse 7 says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So that access is cut off. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, speaking of the garden, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. It's interesting here is that Satan is finally fought and he is beat. 
but not by Jesus. Again, there's no equality between Satan and the Lord. If Jesus were to fight Satan, the battle wouldn't last long enough to record. He would just lose. But God does see fit to allow us to fight battles in his name, and he does the same thing with angels. And so Michael and his angels finally fight. We read about in Jude how Michael didn't rebuke Satan directly, but was like, man, the Lord rebuke you. And you get this sense that Michael's like holding back, holding back. And finally God's like, all right, go to it. And he's like, bum, ba da bum, ba da bum, ba da bum. I mean, he goes after him. And it's the big fight scene in Revelation, and it's like a long time coming. Good. Hoorah. Go in there and kick his butt, Michael. And he does. And um, that's very exciting. I think um, I, against Satan, pathetic. But Michael and his angels going against him, that that's like, you know, pay-per-view. Something worth, <laughs> something worth watching. <laughs> So, so not comparable to God, and he will eventually lose. So back to 1 Peter 5.8, we've got kind of a survey of a lot of facts about Satan, get the idea of who he is biblically. Um, now let's read a little bit more. It says again, I like reading verses more than once. It just helps them stick in our hearts and minds. It says again, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now I've heard it said, just about every time I hear this verse taught, from pastors. They go, but don't worry. He's a lion, but he's got no teeth. That is not accurate. Do you think that the point of this passage is don't worry? Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but don't worry about it. He can't hurt anybody. That's really not the point. I've heard he has no teeth, but that's not entirely true. It misses out on what the passage is saying. If he has no teeth and he can't harm me, then why do I have to be sober and vigilant? Why am I watching out for my adversary? Satan is swaying the entire world to do his will. Satan is controlling the demonic empire. I think he has teeth. Now there's limits to what he can't do and there's things he can do. So that's what I want to focus on for the rest of this time is what can Satan do and what can't Satan do? Well, in Daniel 10, we read about how Satan is, a, it seems, is opposing Gabriel. And Daniel's praying for an answer for prayer. And Gabriel's been dispatched to answer this prayer to give Daniel wisdom. And he says, I would have come earlier. It's been a couple of weeks. I would have come earlier, but I was being resisted. The prince of Persia, a spiritual being, was resisting me. Very likely Satan or certainly someone under his authority. Until Michael came and helped me. And then I was, okay, we beat that and then we move forward. So there was a spiritual battle going on. So he can resist angels. Daniel 10, 13. And angels do a lot. Angels minister to the saints. They protect the saints. They attack the enemies of the saints. They brought food to Elijah. They, bring mess they brought messages to people. And they could still do these things today. Although Hebrews 1 dictates that the primary message bearer from God is Jesus. He spoke to us in times past, you know, da, 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 to the prophets, to the fathers, but now through Jesus. So there's been sort of a shifting over of his way of communicating to us. Satan can also cause physical and mental issues. We read about that. Uh, Matthew 9.33 talks about a, a person that was mute and that this muteness was an affliction because of demonic possession. Read the book of Job, right? Satan goes after and kills Job's children, destroys his crops, kills his cattle, and eventually attacks Job's body with physical illness. So this is something Satan can do. That's something that he can do. He can attack us with physical things. That's a possibility. And of course, we, we certainly obviously think about things like demonic possession. Demonic possession is definitely in the scripture, talks about it. It seems though that is only for unbelievers. I mean, greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. You cannot be filled with the spirit and filled with a demonic spirit at the same time. These things are, are not, that's not rational. So this is only for unbelievers, but demonic possession is a true, genuine thing. It's a reality. It manifests itself in a few different ways. So as I'm looking at scripture and I go, what are some of the sort of evidences that someone might have demonic possession going on? Well, sometimes it manifested itself with blindness or muteness or other issues. Um, in Matthew 12, 22, Jesus not only cast the demon out of a person, but also healed them of blindness and muteness. So that the demonic possession is seen to have caused this physical blindness or muteness. 
It also uh, can be manifested in self-destructive fits. This is actually more than once in the scripture. We have a story of a young man who gets, he goes through like an, a seizure type thing and then he throws himself into the fire. Like he doesn't just throw himself to the ground. No, it's like whatever's the most dangerous direction, that's where he goes. You know, there's, there's, there's a self-destructiveness and that's an evidence of demonic things. In fact, we have the story of Judas who did what? After he had been, said, it said Satan entered him and then he went and betrayed Jesus. And the next thing he does is he goes and kills himself. Now, did Judas choose that? Well, well yeah, he chose it, but also may have well been demonically influenced. We also have the story of the demoniac. The demoniac, Jesus crossed over the Sea of Galilee, and remember the, the demons went out into the pigs, into the swine. But this individual, it says that he was always uh, screaming and all this stuff inside the caves, and he would also cut himself. He would cut himself. That this was a self-destructive thing that was going on as a result of this demonic assault. So that could be an, uh, an evidence of demonic possession. Um, obvious mental issues can be evidence of demonic possession. Now, I'm not here talking about mental retardation, someone who's just mentally handicapped. That's not a mental issue in that sense. That's just their IQ. You know what I mean? This is not really related. But certain obvious mental issues, in fact, that same demoniac in Matthew 5.15, you can read about it. After he, the demon was cast out, he stopped cutting. He didn't need to be bound with chains anymore. In fact, it says that the people came and found him clothed and sitting in his right mind. His right mind. So that this demonic exorcism resulted in a, in a healthy mind at the end of it. Now, I'm just telling you what the scripture says. This, I know this raises some questions. And we'll have time for some questions afterwards if you guys have them. Please write them down or remember them. I may answer them as we continue, though, because <laughs> I'm trying to do that for you. Um, in the past, some people thought that every issue was demonic. That every issue was demonic. They did not get this teaching from the scriptures. This is clear. There were certain issues that were seen as, okay, that's demonic. He cast out demons and healed. Perhaps there was a greater demonic activity because Jesus was on the scene. Maybe, you know, maybe where, where God's obviously moving, you know, Satan's going to try to come in and cause problems. I don't know. But it's clear from the scripture that not everybody who came to Jesus for healing also had a demon cast out of them. Some people were just healed. So we should not act as though every issue is demonic. This is weird and it's not biblical. That's the most important part. <laughs> I'll be weird if it's biblical, but not if it's not. This could divide the body of Christ. That's that issue. To think that everybody who's got an issue is demonic. Oh, it's, oh, it's the demon of alcohol. You drink too much alcohol, that's, that's the demon of alcohol. So I'm going to cast the demon of alcohol out of you. And it's like, wait, are you a believer? Okay, you don't have the demon of alcohol. Right? You have the lack of self-control. Stop drinking so much. Like, that's the cure. That's it. Stop. No, it's more complicated than that. No, I'm telling you, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Translated, stop. <laughs> walk in self-control that's it and and so often we're bound by by sin because we're simply not choosing to be delivered and it makes our hearts feel a little better about it if we could feel powerless because then i don't feel so bad you know but that's not what scripture teaches us scripture empowers us and while uh, while that maybe makes us feel bad it helps deliver us from the thing that's for sure so we don't want to overreact and think that um, every affliction is demonic or every issue is demonic, but we also don't want to underreact and think that every issue is just fixed by lithium. I mean, <laughs> this is not wise. Every issue is not fixed by drugs. There's other things that are going on in people's lives. And I've known enough people who've had mental illnesses to know that drugs aren't the like quick fix that sometimes people think they are. And so um, I don't think that we have to pick one side or the other. I think that we should be open to the scenario and say, I don't know, maybe you need medication, maybe you need exorcism, maybe you need a lot of prayer and you need to get biblical in your worldview, maybe there's, there's this or that or this or that, I don't know, I don't know. And I think that we have to kind of approach each case individually, which seems to be what Jesus did. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, another thing Satan can do that's not, we're moving away from demonic possession because that doesn't really apply to believers very much. 
is he can use hurts, personal wounds, to divide the body of Christ. This is actually one of Satan's tools. Let me read to you 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. In 2 Corinthians 2, 6, we're reading about an, an individual who was excommunicated from the body. He was kicked out of the body, which is an appropriate thing to do under certain circumstances. And he was not allowed to fellowship, but he repented. And so he's like, bring him back. He repented. The only thing that was keeping him from coming back was that repentance. So bring him back. So verse 6, he says, This punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man. So that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Bring him back in. Let's let that sorrow end. You know when you can stop feeling bad about sin? The second you repent. The second you repent. Until then, you should probably feel bad about it. <laughs> but let that sorrow lead you to repentance and then let it end. Now cheer up and love the Lord and serve him. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end, I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I've forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us. For what? Not forgiving. For we are not ignorant of his devices. What was his device in this scenario? Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness in my life can be a device of the enemy to tear the body apart. I've seen it, and probably so have you. Division, separation, the body cutting pieces of itself off because of bitterness, and, and, and not just unrepentance, but unforgiveness. That's a device of the enemy. Another thing Satan, it seems to me, can do is send us evil thoughts and temptations. Um, in Genesis 3, we read about how Satan tempted Eve. In Matthew 4, we read about how Satan took, uh, was led by the Spirit, God was led by the Spirit, Jesus, to head out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So he was tempted by the devil during that 40 days of fasting. He was tempted. In Ephesians 6, we read this, Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. That's a... Uh, uh, an arrow that was set on fire that was shot over the wall. It was supposed to land on something and then spread and begin a raging flame. That was the idea. But the shield of faith will quench those things. And I think that those are the thoughts. Those are the ideas. Those are the concepts, the temptations that come our way. In Acts 5.3, we have another example. And this, I think, clinches my case for <laughs> the enemy can send thoughts. Um, I don't know that he can read minds, but I do think he can send thoughts. I mean, I can send thoughts. I'm sending them right now. <laughs> Just using words to do it. Um, but it's, uh, it's where Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, lie. And Peter, listen to what he says. He says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Why has Satan filled your heart to lie? So Peter, he had genuine spiritual discernment. I mean, he knew it was a lie. This was wisdom from the Lord. And his discernment was also to realize the source of this stuff was a satanic attack on their lives, and they yielded to it. I think that Satan can send us evil ideas. I do. Now, I don't think that I'm constantly oppressed with this constantly every moment of the day. I'm not possessed or something like this. But I do think that this happens. I think we have a biblical case for it. It's easy to see... This, in your own life, I think, when you seem to have a really bad idea, as if it's a really good idea. <laughs> and you're like, normally I wouldn't do this. This isn't part of my normal operating procedure, but man, I'm suddenly having this horrific idea that's, that would risk my, my own walk with the Lord, my fellowship, my family, you know, risk something. You know, I'm planning something that just is, is horrible. I had a family member one time that lied to me about something just so so ridiculous and they called me later and told me and they were like, I don't know why I did that. I'm sorry. I just totally lied to you. I don't even know why I did it. And I think that Satan just wants to rip us apart. Now that person still is guilty for lying, right? Just like Ananias was guilty for lying. We're not putting responsibility on Satan and off of us. But we're recognizing that these ideas can come into our hearts and minds and sometimes we have to go, you know what? This is spiritual battle. This is a difficult, honest, satanic attack. I'm going to hold up the shield of faith. I'm going to quench that fiery dart. And I'm going to move on serving Jesus. Because when you realize it's a battle, you become sober and vigilant. But if you think it's just, just you, nothing else is going on, then we can let our guard down. 
<clears throat> Satan wants to twist us towards sin. And so we have to have a strong sense of holiness in our lives. We really, really do for our own sakes. Another thing that Satan can do, we're talking about what he can do. I'll get to what he can't do in a minute. <laughs> what Satan can do is he can control the unsaved. He can control the unsaved. We talked about how the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. 2 Timothy 2.26, it describes the unsaved as having been taken captive by him, Satan, to do his will. That the unsaved have are captive, they're captivated, they're in his control, and they're going to do his will. Now, it's not very hard to see this. Just take a look at Holly Weird. I meant, I mean, Holly Weird. I'm, no, I meant Holly Weird. Yeah, I mean, look at them. Look at the things that are coming out of the movie industry and the TV industry and the music industry. I remember one time watching a documentary. It's, it's like, how do you not see the hypocrisy of this? I don't know. It was a documentary made by MTV about the music industry and how they are prejudiced against Christians. And they weren't shamed, ashamed of it. They were just like making an observation. It was really weird. And in the, in the music industry, they interviewed bands like Creed, who were, was out for a while. They were really popular for like 10 minutes. And they had that one song you heard. And they, um, they were interviewed. And while they're being interviewed, what happened to Creed is people thought, because he took songs that sounded like worship songs, lyrics that sounded like they were from worship songs and he put them into songs and he was like the son of a pastor and so they thought he was a christian they thought oh it's a christian band it's a christian band and creed put out this whole like like propaganda thing to de-christianize themselves and they and they and they were interviewing the singer and they were like yeah then they started saying we were christian and we're like dude this is going to kill our career so we had to do everything we could to show people we're not christians There, been, there was an interview from another producer who was not a believer himself, but he had several bands that he worked with, and one of them was Christian, and he thought they had a really good sound, and he thought they could go really far. So he's being interviewed, and he says, yeah, I would send them the demo, and they said they loved it, and they thought it was a hit, they thought it would be a number one hit, but then they would always say, but aren't they a Christian band? And so I had a really hard time getting this band radio play. And so MTV concludes... This is what they said about their own industry. In the music industry, it's okay if you are openly satanic. It's okay if you are any kind of weird Rastafarian, this, that, doesn't matter. You could be cross-dressing, screaming about hating and killing your mom, but you don't want to be Christian. That's the one thing you don't want to be or it'll kill your career. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. They couldn't even tell you why they're that way. They just couldn't tell you why. Our students in schools, they are constantly told, the students at our church, in their local schools, that they could do projects. In fact, I, like I've had a student say, I'm supposed to do a project on a, uh, a person from history who inspired me. And he's like, so I picked Jesus. Like, why not, man? He's my Lord. And the teacher said, you can't do Jesus. And so I asked, well, what were some other people picking? And he goes, well, one kid picked Muhammad. And I said, and they could do Muhammad? And he says, yes. In fact, the teacher gave Muhammad as an example of a good person to do the project on. But you can't do Jesus. Why is that? Because the world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Teachers say things like, okay, yeah, sure, you can do that project on God, but you can't use the Bible. I hear that one constantly from our students. But you can't use the Bible. You can't use the Bible. You can't reference the Bible. You can't even talk about it. If I was Muslim and I wanted to use the Quran, you'd let me do that. It's just the world lies under the sway of the wicked one. In politics, we see this as our political parties become not only more and more liberal, but they become more and more ungodly morally. Their moral landscape is just like slip sliding down the hill. In our colleges, we see this where atheism and immorality are promoted with arrogance and pride. And Christianity is told to stick their heads in the sand and to stay quiet. You're not wanted anymore. It's shameful. But we have to be careful because if Satan's controlling the unsaved, that means that he's controlling the people in the world who we are friends with that aren't saved. Now, we sometimes want to think of them as they're just a good bloke. You know, <laughs> they're just like my good friend. But we have to realize that if you're not being controlled by the Lord, then you are being controlled by the enemy, ultimately. 
Not every, in, every little action, but the swaying, the general flow. And so Satan will try to use the world to attack you and the world to recruit you. And so we have to be super careful in our worldly relationships that they're not worldly <laughs> relationships. That I have two types of relationships. With believers, I have fellowship. And with the world, I have evangelism. I have outreach. And I need to keep it focused on that or else I will slip slide, slip slide into the sins of these people. And there's a balance here, but the scripture seems to indicate this when it says things like, come out from among them and be my people and I will be your God. Yet we're to go into them as, as missionaries, evangelists, to, to, to bring them to us, but not to join them in the world, but not of the world. And to find this balance. Satan also, if, since he's controlling the unsaved, he can use nations to persecute believers, like with Herod slaughtering the children. We read in Revelation, in Matthew 4, you read about that. Herod slaughtered the children to try to, try to kill the Messiah, <clears throat> the king. Um, in Revelation 12, we read about how the, this, this dragon, he's cast down, he went to devour the child. And this seems to be a reference to maybe what was going on with Herod. So we see the satanic control that was going on behind that. Why was Herod flipping out? Why was he so paranoid about his self-control stuff? Well, that, that relates back to Satan. Um, let me give you guys a Christian worldview moment. If the world lies under the sway of the wicked one, then the nations of the world, ultimately, although God's sovereign, but he's allowing this to happen, okay? And so I'm not devaluing the sovereignty of God, but in his sovereignty, he's allowing this to happen. The world lies under the sway of the wicked one. This is why I think in a Christian worldview, it's a really good idea to have a minimal federal government with less authority and less power and less ability to persecute the citizens of that country. Because when it turns, it's less harmful. Now this is something that our founding fathers thought for other reasons. I think in a biblical sense, it just makes sense. It's like, yeah, having a limited government with limited abilities and limited powers, that makes sense to us as Christians. I don't want to try to create a Christian government because inevitably it's going to end up under the sway of the wicked one and now it's in the name of Christ. So I don't want to try to create a theocracy like that. I want a theocracy in my own life, you know, but not try to create a governmental theocracy. But it makes sense to me to have a government with limited power so it has less ability to turn on the citizens and the believers <laughs> that are in their midst because we've seen that happen over and over again in history. We're seeing it happen right now. There's a genocide going on. We finally called it genocide, as if it wasn't already that. Now we've labeled it, um, and that's what's happening. <clears throat> so Satan also, in, in addition to being controlling the unsaved, according to Scripture, Satan creates false religions and false doctrines. Did you know this? This is actually in there. In 1 Timothy 4, it talks about doctrines of demons. Let me read it to you. Now the Spirit expressly says, that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So there's false doctrines being brought in, that, attempting to be brought into the church. I mean, Satan wants nothing more to, than to be a member and elder and pastor of a church. Or all the churches, if possible. <laughs> That's like obviously his desire. Um, he wants to control and bring in deceptive things, which is why we need to test all things and hold fast what is good. We've got to really be in the word. He's going to disguise himself as an angel of light. We know this. Genesis 3, Satan brings a false doctrine. You're not going to die when you eat of that fruit. No, you're going to be like God. And he brings in a false doctrine. Eve believes it, and hence her fall. 2 Corinthians 11 says this. 2 Corinthians 11.3, But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we've not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you've not received, or a different gospel which you've not accepted, you may well put up with it. He's worried. He's like, you guys are so experienced, and you're not based on just what Scripture teaches and sticking to the doctrine, that I'm, I'm afraid you're going to get off. So the point is that Satan perverts God's word. He puts a multiplicity of false religions all around the world just to confuse people. Just to confuse them. If there was just one religion and then non-religious people, it would be a lot, a lot easier for people. But no, he's like, you know what I'm going to do? Let me make 10,000 false religions. There we go. That's better. I'm just going to make it as confusing as I can. <clears throat> now in Revelation, we read about how he'll have a huge worldwide false religion going on with the worship of himself at the center of it. 
I think that one way to test this is the two, two things to check. Is my gospel solidly biblical? For that, I would recommend reading Galatians carefully. And the other is, is my sense of holiness intact? Or have I watered down sin? And I'm okay with sin as if it's not sin. It's like, yeah, you know, whatever. But for me, it's okay because of this, 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 this. That ultimately, I think, is a demonic thing. Um, another, so is the gospel intact? And then is my sense of holiness intact? Because if you feel sin is okay, then what he did to Eve is what's happening to you. No, this, I don't think there's anything wrong with this. Another thing Satan can do is he can harass us, harass, not possess, harass us with physical or spiritual assaults. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, did you realize how much the Bible talked about Satan before today? <laughs> it's a lot. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 and 8. It says, And lest I should be exalted above measure, Paul speaking, by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Of course, God told him, my grace is sufficient for you. He's like, just resist and stand strong. Um, Paul's thorn, while it was according to God's will, that's for sure, it was a messenger of Satan. It was something that he saw as a demonic attack in his life. It may have been an emotional attack, an intellectual attack, or a physical one. I, I lean towards the idea that it was physical um, because he calls it a thorn in his flesh. And so I think it was a physical thing. Um, King Saul was assaulted with a distressful spiritual attack that he would experience. At some point, in addition to these possible attacks, at some point, Satan will have false signs and lying wonders. Second Thessalonians says that the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all powers, signs, and lying wonders. So there may be false miracles, things like that, to trick people into believing. So, that's, again, reason why we have to be biblically based, because I might see a, a, a fancy, ooh, what was that? And it's deceptive, but yet, you know, the only, God is not the only spiritual power at work. There's also evil power at work as well. So this is why we're told to be sober and be vigilant in 1 Peter 5.8. Be sober, which means be fully aware, fully alert, understand the, the dangers that are going on, and also to be vigilant. And I think the idea here is get into fighting mode. Vigilant, like, I'm ready to go. What is that? I'm ready. This is what we have to do spiritually speaking. I know you're like, you're so intimidating, Mike, when you, when you get into your, your Bruce Lee stance. I know, I know, it's scary. But don't worry. Um, this is why we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we do wrestle against principalities and powers. This is the battle. This is the struggle. I have to realize that when me and my wife have a, an argument, I don't know if I'd use the word fight. I don't like that word used describing a, a husband and wife interacting. I don't think it's healthy. But, but we have a disagreement, argument, even though it might be tense or it might be unhap unhappy moment, you know. I need to realize and stop for a second and go, I'm not fighting with her. I'm fighting for her. This is, I'm, I need to fight for my marriage, not about my marriage. There's a difference. I'm not fighting flesh and blood, but the enemy wants to use this. Because sin or pride or distorted views of holiness, they're all like little handles that we attach to ourselves that then Satan can grab to rip us apart and to pull us down. Unforgiveness, I just put the handle there and now I'm, I'm not ignorant of his devices. I've, I'm, I'm here. He can yank on me anytime he wants because I'm leaving this thing in my life. And he will. So what can't Satan do? <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, Satan cannot do several things. One, he cannot rule in hell as the king of his domain. Number two, he cannot separate me from the love of God. Romans 8, 31. Number three, he cannot take me out of Jesus' hands. John 10, verses 28 and 29. So he cannot pull the salvation of Christ out of my life. That's pretty nice. Because that's the most important thing in my life, and he can't touch it. He also can't resist Jesus. In Mark 5, this demoniac filled with demons, when he sees Jesus, he comes and he bows and worships. And I don't think this is the kind of worship of love. I think it was a fearful thing. I think they were scared. So they bowed their knee. This uncontrollable demoniac, totally controlled by Jesus. To attack Job, Satan needed permission. And so there's limits to what he can and can't do in my life even. Because if he didn't have limits, what do you think our lives would look like? It probably wouldn't be so good. 
Another thing Satan can't do, he can't win. <laughs> he cannot win. He's going to lose. We will prevail. He will not prevail. Like Jesus said, on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. In James 4, 7, we're told that if we resist the devil, he will flee from us, which tells us something else. All of Satan's attacks are temporary. We see this consistently. He tempts Jesus for 40 days. He comes and tempts him in the garden again. He's harassing him. We see that his attack on Job was for a season and then it had to stop. All of Satan's attacks seem to come in surges and then they go away. So all we have to do as Christians is stand our ground. Stay strong in the Lord and the power of his might. We're to be sober, to be vigilant. We're to resist him, as it says in verse 9, steadfast in the faith. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Satan was defeated at the cross. That breaks his power over you, but it doesn't break his attempt to mess with you <laughs> through temptation and worldly attacks. He can't control believers directly through, uh, I think, demons of alcohol and demons of drugs and demons of anger and demons of unforgiveness. No, those are our issues. He'll use them to mess with us, but we need to deal with our issues. Otherwise, telling people to repent would be pointless. We wouldn't go out and tell people to repent. We would just go cast out demons. So verse 9, 1 Peter 5, 9, let's get to the bottom line of what do I do? What do I do? It says, resist him, resist him, steadfast in the faith. That's how I resist. It's that phrase, steadfast or continuing, very centered on the faith. And those of you who are Sunday night regulars, like you know what the faith means, right? When the Bible says faith, it's talking about belief. When it says the faith, it's always talking about doctrine, theology. Not the fact that we believe, but what we believe. On our website, on our church, we have a list of, you know, what we believe. We believe this, we believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We believe salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, apart from works. We believe, we believe, we believe, we believe. That's how we resist him. We stay steadfast in the faith. Specific faiths, as in God is holy, God is righteous, God will judge, God is love, God is merciful. We believe in the identity of Jesus as described in the scriptures. We believe this world is passing. We believe this action is wrong and this action is right. And there's no argument about it. That's the faith. We're thinking biblically, in other words. <laughs> As I give a plug for my own Sunday night service. But we're thinking biblically. That's the idea. We're steadfast in the faith. But how do you not only have the faith, but you stay steadfast in it? I think you simply apply it. You take belief into actions. And that means patience. Okay, I'm feeling down. I'm feeling oppressed. I'm feeling attacked. I'm feeling hardship right now. But I'm going to wait on the Lord and he will strengthen my heart. That is the reception of God's plan for our lives. That he has an overall plan. Romans 8.28. That's the doctrine that I'm receiving when I say I'm just going to be patient and wait on the Lord. When I trust God, I say, God, I don't understand what's going on right now. I don't know what is going on in my head or in my heart or in my life or with my friends or with my family. But one thing I know is you're sovereign and you're good. And when I receive that, I'm going to, I'm going to stay steadfast in the faith. I'm not going to abandon my trust. When I hold biblical morality, instead of shifting to worldly morality on hot button issues, like, like homosexuality or you name it, abortion. And I hold biblical morality instead of worldly morality. It's the reception of the doctrine that God is holy. You see how these doctrines apply into our lives. You know, doctrines, you know, when you put doctrine, I was like putting sneakers on so I can go run. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold fast to these specific things. Because sin gives Satan that handle. And I want to remove that handle. When... I am bold in my faith and lovingly unashamed and standing strong in the truths of who Jesus is, no matter what opposition I face. I'm just receiving the fact that Jesus told me, you're the light of the world, right? And don't be surprised when they do this to you, look what they did to me. So I'm just holding those doctrines. When I deal with guilt by going to the cross, I'm just receiving the doctrine of how I got saved and how forgiveness is accomplished. When I forgive others because of the cross, I'm just receiving how I got saved and applying it. In, and so it's all applying of doctrine. When I worry and I'm tripping out and I'm concerned, the answer is pray, thank God, and choose to trust him. And if people think that that's cliche, it's because they're not willing to do it. This is the worry solution. It may not cause all your worries to suddenly disappear, but the only thing that does that is unconsciousness. <laughs> so you can also go to sleep. <laughs> but 
but no, but this is the direction we move in, you know, so we could see God's, God's help in our lives. I think the proper application of doctrine leads a Christian to a place of mental health. Mental health. And sometimes we have a hard time receiving that, but I think it's just the truth. So let's just read on real quick. Um, he says in verse 10, But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you've suffered for a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So this is a good word for us who are maybe going through struggles. Because I, I think it would be easier to say raise your hand if you're not going through any struggles. <laughs> Because I don't think I've ever had a time where I wasn't. But, um, but yes, after a while, after you've suffered for a while, he'll perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. You won't be perfected. You won't be settled. You won't be established and strengthened without the suffering. He's doing a work in our lives. Let's look at what he's doing through the, through the things we're going through. And verse 11 says, To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I've written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who's in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. That would be guys and guys. <laughs> so don't be weird about it. Um, peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So a perfectly pure greeting of love to just have their relationships marked by love. Uh, Mark is going to be coming with him. I think that it's neat that he calls Mark his son. Peter had a connection. He didn't distance himself in ministry. Some pastors do that, and that's unfortunate. Um, but he says at the very end, and this is what I want to focus on, he says, Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. You know, everybody loves the message of peace. But it's limited. It's, there, there's a caveat. You guys have heard the, the term caveat before. It means an explanation to prevent misinterpretation. And so he says... He says, peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. And there's only peace in Jesus. And there is no ultimate peace without Jesus. Um, to be Christian and think that peace can be offered apart from being in Christ is to be a Christian who's not very Christian. But that's the world we live in. That's a, that's a doctrine of demons right there. That you can be saved without Jesus. It doesn't make any sense. All right, well. Let's pray, and then I'll, if you guys have any questions or thoughts, we can uh, share those. Father, we thank you for your holy word, and we pray that we would be armed and equipped to be steadfast. Our lives are under attack. We pray that through a survey of these topics, we could apply it by seeing how we are being attacked so that we can stand strong, not fearful, but vigilant, Lord. Know that we've been equipped for this battle. We don't even have to fight to defeat the enemy, but simply to hold our ground until you come. We're thankful for that, Lord. And we pray that we would be a balanced spiritual people who can see spiritual attacks, but yet who don't um, see them where they're not. Um, we just pray we'd see things as they are. Give us that wisdom, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I cast all my cares down before you. I lose all my fears here before you live each day by your grace. Walking evermore by faith